Hello everyone, welcome live. My name is Nissa. I'm the owner of Magic of Paws, here to help you help your pets. And today we're specifically talking about anxious dogs as far as the pets that we're talking about. If you're watching live, please let me know where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, please let me know that you are here, uh, that you came back to watch it. So I always like to see who watches on the replay. Anyway, just a few warnings. Sorry, the lighting isn't that great today. We're got a thunderstorm going outside, which is my second warning that with the thunder going off, the dogs here at the resort are gonna be a little bit more on edge than they usually are. So if you hear them in the background, that is why. <laughs> There's a, I can see the dark clouds going across the sky. So let's just dive right on in and get started. So first of all, let's just talk about what anxiety is, especially in dogs. So people know what anxiety is in people. It's that feeling of unease, that uh, something dangerous is about to happen. It's almost like a state of fear. And that's more common what we see in dogs is that fear state. Common causes are, you know, as unique as each individual dog. It's just like every single person has different causes for anxiety. One thing that is pretty consistent is that dogs tend to express anxiety when their needs are not being met, whatever those needs are, whether they're predictability or their dietary needs, exercise needs, stimulation needs, whatever it might be. There's also a genetic component most likely uh, in many cases, not in all cases, but you do see that there are some breeds that are predisposed to anxiety, as well as you'll see it hereditarily in different family lines, which is why often great breeders will never breed a dog that shows signs of anxiety because they don't want to risk it being genetic and passing it down. There's a whole bunch of different ways that people can know that their dogs have anxiety. And I'd love to know in the comments, let me know if you can think of any signs of anxiety that your dogs or even cats uh, can demonstrate. As I'd love to get your feedback about what you're seeing at home. There's a huge spectrum of what anxiety can look like in a given dog. And it varies from dog to dog, and it can vary from the same dog from day to day. So just because I say a list here and your dog's behavior isn't on the list doesn't mean it's not anxiety, but also by that same token, if I say something and you're like, wow, that's my dog, it doesn't necessarily mean that your dog is anxious. These are all general things that some dogs will express but not all, and some will express some of this list, but not all. General things that we see are an inability to settle, always seeming to be on edge, being reactive to noises and sights, um, anything that's out of the ordinary, a fear of things that are new. So if a new piece of furniture comes in or a, um, something gets dropped on the floor that they don't normally see. Anything that's different can sometimes lead to anxiety in dogs um, or a, an aversion to things that are new can be a sign of anxiety in dogs. You can also see pacing, whining, destructive behaviors like chewing um, or self-destructive behaviors like licking or um, excessive self-grooming. Some animals will even lick themselves to the point where they have no hair in a specific spot. Sometimes you'll see more physiological signs like uh, troubles with their digestive system, hot spots on their skin, uh, tendency towards ear infections. But every single dog manifests these in different ways. Sometimes it's resource guarding, sometimes it's reactivity out on walks, uh, excessive barking. Anything that seems out of the ordinary for your dog is usually a sign that something's not quite right. And if you see a uh, repetitive behavior that's lasting even after stressful events have gone past, 
sometimes that's a sign of more generalized anxiety as well. So keeping an eye on all of that. As far as body language, you're going to see things like the ears are going to be tight, tucked tighter to their heads. Sometimes the eyes will be wide, giving you that whale eye, uh, tight mouth. If they're wagging their tail, it's usually slow and low as opposed to up and fast. Uh, or they tend to make themselves smaller. But at the same time, you have some dogs that make themselves bigger because they are afraid and they want to look intimidating. So as I said, all of these are different signs that are going to be very different from dog to dog. I have two anxious dogs at home. How I can tell Wish is anxious is very different from how I can tell Boomer is anxious. And it all comes down to observing them and seeing what their patterns of behavior are. If you were to do a training session with me and work one-on-one, -on -one, one of the first assignments I give almost every family is to observe their dog's body language for a week writing down what they see, what's going on, so that they can build up that awareness to notice what's going on in their dog's lives when they might be a little bit on the anxious side. Now, anxiety can have huge implications, not just a lower quality of life, though that is a very important thing. We want our dogs to have the best quality life possible. It can have long-term implications, especially health related. Dogs that have chronic anxiety are more predisposed, just like people, to certain chronic health issues, cardiovascular related, sometimes metabolism. I've already mentioned digestion, causing issues with that as well. Anytime you have a long-term exposure to the stress horm hormone cortisol, you're going to see uh, physiological effects in the body. Again, that vary from dog to dog, but they can be chronic and they can be very serious on their own, not just dealing with the behavior side of things. The behavior side of things are super important to deal with too because chronic anxiety in dogs can have impacts on their daily behavior and their interactions with everything they come across. So if you have a dog that's so anxious that they're not sleeping well, you're going to notice that they're going to be a little bit more on edge and that's gonna make them more anxious, which will make them sleep more poorly again. And it's just a cycle. You'll see that a lot with anxious behaviors is that there are a feedback loop of I'm anxious, so I'm doing this, which makes me feel anxious. So I'm gonna do this, which makes me feel anxious. It just goes back and forth. Daily behavior things, the things that people bring to me as the biggest issues are inability to go for walks, having to walk really early in the morning or really late at night to avoid people on those walks because seeing people on or dogs or cars or whatever it might be whips their dog up into a frenzy to the point where they can't enjoy the walk. It can also have impacts on the relationships with the people in the home. Dogs often, if they get into a certain level of anxiety, they may redirect that anxiety in less than ideal ways. Usually you'll see this as redirecting onto another dog or another animal in the family, where if they're barking, 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 and another dog comes up to them, they'll turn and snap at that other dog for invading their space. It can also happen with humans. A lot of times dogs that have chronic anxiety that's been unmanaged, hasn't been addressed, it can escalate into fear behaviors that look a little bit more like aggression, biting, growling, snapping, anything like that. Dogs with anxiety often also have trouble going to the vet or going to the groomer or going anywhere in the car. Again, it's different for every single dog. You're going to see these big implications be a little bit more specialized down to the individual dog. But the big overarching thing that I hear from my clients and see from people on the internet is that their dog's anxiety impacts their daily life. Whether that's not being able to have people over to the house, dreading getting a package from the UPS or the FedEx guy, not being able to go to the vet or the groomer or be able to take a peaceful walk. It's different for every family, every dynamic. 
but the common theme is that it really does hinder their everyday lives once it gets to a certain point. So what about how to manage this? There's a variety of approaches to this. So there's obviously, like with people, there are medications and supplements that you can take, uh, which I would always recommend you discuss with your veterinarian. And ideally with a veterinary behaviorist, they're going to have a much deeper understanding of behavioral medications than your general practice veterinarian. Not because your everyday vet isn't an amazing individual, but they have to know so much that when they have to do a deep dive into a specific ind individual area, like if they try one medication and it doesn't work, they tend to get stumped because they have to have this wide breadth of knowledge. They need to be able to go from treating a dog with an ear infection to treating an anxious dog to then going into a spay and then coming out and setting a bone and then doing a dental. They're, what they have to do in a general day is so varied that their, their knowledge is a mile wide but an inch deep, whereas a veterinary behaviorist, while they did have all the same schooling as your regular vet, spend their professional careers focusing on one small subset of veterinary medicine, which is behavior. So they are an inch wide, but a mile deep. And that makes a huge difference when you are trying to deal with chronic behavior issues. So outside of talking to your vet about a medication or a supplement, there are things that you can do in your daily life that can impact your dog's anxiety levels. So there's different ways to calm your dog, either in an acute moment or long term. Different ways that work very quickly are to reach in this groove behind the ear. If you rub right in there, that is an acupressure point for dogs that helps them to relax. It helps take the edge off. If they were truly afraid of for their lives, rubbing behind their ears isn't going to change that but it will help take that edge off just a little bit so that they can help to calm themselves. Other things you can do are providing pressure on their sides. Uh, just like we like hugs when we're stressed out, dogs and most mammals appreciate slight pressure on the sides. There's different ways to accomplish that. Commercial way is to purchase a thunder shirt, which is appropriate for the thunderstorm that's going on right now. The idea behind that is it provides constant pressure around the chest, which helps them to feel a little bit calmer. You can also get the same effect by using a, um, a compression wrap. If you have that, those tend to take a lot longer to apply than a thunder shirt. But if you're worried about proof of concept, that's one way to go. One of the things that I do with Boomer is I taught him to go between my legs when he's stressed out and I will just apply gentle pressure with my legs when he's standing between them. It's the same idea of like a squeeze shoe for cattle or sheep works just the same in dogs. Other things you can do is get them used to using their noses quite a bit. There's been a lot of scientific research done that shows that when dogs get into a really deep sniff, it actually changes what's going on in their brain, which allows them to relax more, take in more information and grow new connections in their brains, leading to an overall lower anxiety over time. You can also use uh, products like I want to say comfort zone, but that's not the name anymore. Adaptal uh, or other uh, appeasing pheromones, DAP, dog appeasing pheromones, which basically emulate the same pheromones that mother dogs emit to their puppies to keep them calm and relaxed. Again, work better for some dogs than others. And really with those, the method of application, the method of use is really important. If you are using a plug-in diffuser, you want to use it in a small space or right next to their bed where they hang out. Or you can use, they have like a collar that's like a flea collar. There's sprays that you can put on a bandana. Those are all options too. I could go on and on and on. There's canine meditation. You can teach them uh, biofeedback, like a neural feedback loop. Uh, there's different 
grounding exercises that you can do, but that gets more into the training end of things, which is also super important. I'm a dog trainer. I'm not going to tell you not to train your dog, but it's just one of the ways that you can, can deal with it. There's no one thing that I can train a dog to do that's going to make it calm. <laughs> forever. You can teach a good settle. You can go through the protocol for relaxation, which is a two week long protocol to help them learn how to continue to stay relaxed, regardless of what's going on around them. You can teach them different grounding techniques. Boomer's favorites are to boop, to take his nose and touch it to my hand. That's his way of checking in with me to let me know that he is okay. It's also my way to check in with him and be like, our how is your your level if he's so stressed out that he can't boop that tells me that i need to take him out of that situation and go somewhere else you can also teach them to communicate in other ways one of the things that i worked really hard with boomer on when i first got him was to teach him that he can walk away if something is stressful and scary he can take himself away from it. And I give him permission to do that. And a way to communicate that if he's in a situation where he doesn't have freedom of motion. So if he's on a leash and he's super stressed out, he comes to middle. He stands between my legs. I give him the squeeze. We turn and we go. That's also part of the training. There's other more detailed protocols that you can go into for specific situations. Like if they freak out every time someone pulls in the driveway, you can do desensitization and counter conditioning exercises for that, which is essentially pairing a scary thing with an awesome thing, which is usually food. I do that a lot with grooming. So if a dog is not so comfortable with being handled or having, or being brushed, I'll, get a licky mat, smear peanut butter or cream cheese on it, and they have to lick, lick, lick. While they're licking, I'm brushing. As soon as they stop licking, I stop brushing. So that way, the brush and the yummy, delicious thing on the licky mat are always connected. And that can help them get over that in the long term. You can do the same thing with sounds and noises. I am always encouraging people to figure out what specifically is setting your dog off especially if it's something consistent. So if you know that it's a stranger pulling into the driveway and you can recruit a friend or a neighbor to pull their car into the driveway and work on getting your dog used to that, there's safe ways to do that. You just want to make sure that you're keeping your dog under their threshold. So dogs all have this threshold of sensory input. And then dogs with anxiety, it tends to be things that scare them. And once they get to this point of arousal where they're right at their breaking point, when they go over that, it's what's called tipping, where basically you'll see, and I'm sure you've all seen this, where your dog gets to a certain arousal point and it's like their brain completely shuts off. You could be doing, like giving them verbal cues for things that they've known their whole lives, like sit, and it's just going right over their head. And it's not that they're not listening, it's just that there's so much going on in their brain that they can't process it. So you always wanna stay below that threshold to make sure that you're getting as much learning in as possible. As soon as you hit that threshold, your dog is just going to shut down. And that goes for not just anxious dogs, but any dogs, regardless of what is causing their threshold, once they go past it, they're like, you have to wait for them to calm down. You can help them calm down for sure. But once they go past that point, you're not going to make any progress. And in dogs with anxiety, their threshold tends to be lower. And once they get past it, it tends to have more of a negative impact on their learning than a dog without anxiety. In dogs with anxiety, when they get to that point, it's what we call flooding, where they basically are being constantly exposed to something that's terrifying to them and they can't remove themselves from the situation. <coughs> Sorry. When they get to that point, it's almost like they shut down. It's like a learned helplessness. So we want to avoid that as much as possible in order to make sure that we keep going forward. So one other thing that I really encourage people to do regardless of whether their dog has anxiety or not, is to create a safe and comfortable environment. What do I mean by that? <laughs> 
So that's different for every family and it's different for every dog. But some pretty consistent things for providing a routine. They want to know that dinner and breakfast are going to happen at certain times that, you know, certain things happen at certain times. It doesn't need to be down to the minute, but even if it's just the same order, providing some sort of predictability will really help your anxious dog. It takes away that fear of the unknown. If they know that when we wake up in the morning, you know, we go outside for potty break, come inside and get breakfast and then go for a walk. If they have that routine every morning, it's going to make them a little bit less stressed. And then as you get you know, more and more added into the routine, you're going to see that anxiety level go down and down and down as things become more predictable. You also want to make sure that you're providing, um, sorry, the thunderstorm has set off the kittens and they're using the treadmill. <laughs> you also want to make sure that you're providing enough mental stimulation for your dogs. And this can look all sorts of different ways. My favorite way is to use my dog's meals, which they're already going to be eating to provide that stimulation, whether it's just with a simple scatter feed or it's using a puzzle or a treat dispensing toy to get that impact, that brain going. Using a, a walk as a sniffing walk where they just spend as much time sniffing whatever they want to smell is another great way because it also pairs in with what we talked about earlier of that the more that dogs use their noise, noses, the more positive structural changes we're going to see in their brain. So using that mental stimulation, those toys, those puzzles, playing games with them, doing training, that all counts. Even if it's something as simple as scattering their food across the floor so they have to sniff around for it, you're going to see a huge improvement doing just something as simple as that compared to feeding your dog in a bowl. You can also use uh, those various calming aids that I talked about earlier. So your pheromone diffusers using uh, essential oils like lavender, chamomile, those sorts of things to help reduce and take the edge off as well. Providing a quiet space for your dog, especially if they're no noise phobic, like to thunder is going on right now, having a space where they can go where they're not going to be able to hear those noises, whether it's a room that you've soundproofed, uh, like a closet, or you're playing white noise or music for something to help blot out those noises as well. You want to make sure that they just also have a space that they can go to be alone. For most dogs, this is their crate. It doesn't have to be a crate. My dogs personally don't have crates in my house, not because I don't like crates, but because I just don't have them in the house. My dogs don't go into them when I have them and they have found their other spaces that make them feel confident and comfortable instead. For Wish, she loves to hang out in the coat closet in her entryway. There's a shelf in there that she hides under. She loves it. That's her safe space. Boomer has taken over our guest room. So sorry if you ever stay with us. Boomer has taken over the guest room. It's his room now. Um, but we also have various areas throughout the house where there's you know, comfy beds that are off in the corner so that they can choose to be with us regardless of what room we're, we're in. They can be somewhere nearby so they can see us and check in. That often helps anxious dogs quite a bit as well. So we just went over a lot. <laughs> if you have questions about anxiety in dogs, please go ahead, drop them in the comments. I'd love to answer any specific questions that you have about your dog, bearing in mind that every dog is different and I can only speak in generalities unless your dog is one of the dogs that I have met in person. So I'd love to go ahead and just anything personalized if you're watching the replay, please still go ahead and put those questions down in the comments and I will do my best to answer them after. Um, but in general, make sure that you're watching live in the future so that you can get your questions asked, answered right on the air. We are gonna be having a few more live sessions coming up on different subjects just to keep things interesting, get back into the habit of doing this live discussion and checking in with everybody. So the next one is going to be Monday and they're all going to be at four o'clock Eastern time because that's when I'm the most awake. <laughs> so 
start on Monday, we're going to be discussing the benefits of using enrichment for specifically to help with anxiety. We touched on it a little bit today, but we're going to do a full deep dive into it on Monday. Then on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about kind of the more of the history and the understanding of anxiety. How do we know that dogs feel anxiety? This is an emotion. How it, I thought dogs didn't have emotions. Going into that sort of development of our knowledge and how the research has grown. And then next Friday, we'll be talking um, specifically about the top five most commonly asked questions that I get about anxiety. So that will be a super important day if you do have questions because we'll go over our top five, but I'll also have a bunch of a Q&A session available at the end of it if you have any more specific questions. So that's the plan for next week. I do have them planned for the rest of the month. If you go on to um, the main Facebook page or into our um, YouTube page, you'll be able to see when everything is scheduled. You can check that there. All right, we did get a question. So Magic isn't food motivated. Do you have suggestions for bringing her back or to get her attention when she approaches her threshold without treats? Yes. So it's super common that dogs, when they get to their threshold, that even if they are food motivated, they'll refuse treats. Um, I'm working with a dog one-on-one -on -one right now who takes treats no problem at home, but will not touch them out on walks. So one of the things that I always encourage people to do is to work on different grounding techniques while their dog is calm to make it more ingrained going future. That's essentially what Boomer's Boop is. When I hold my hand out to him, he doesn't always take treats when he's stressed out and scared. Don't blame him. But if I hold my hand out to him, he'll see like, oh, and he will use it as an opportunity to check in with him. Uh, other things you can do are to use noises. If your dog isn't noise phobic, but actually likes certain noises, like kissy noises, squeaky toys, whatever it is, that can often redirect them to look back at you. Uh, there's also, you can use a favorite toy. There, you can even use, depending on the dog, you can use different kinds of gentle touch. Some dogs, when they're really at their threshold and they're super overstimulated, if you touch them, they'll re react. You know your dogs better than I do. So if you think that your dog would react that way, don't, don't risk it. But if you do feel like your dog is comfortable with touch in those moments, finding ways to connect with them. With Boomer, I touch him lightly on the bottom and just scratch at the base of his tail and that will often break him out of whatever he's doing. Uh, with Wish, I make kissy noises and she gets super excited about those. Uh, you can also use, uh, depending on how they're acting in the moment, you can use different forms of positioning to get their attention. So again, I'll use Boomer as an example. When he gets super overstimulated and really overwhelmed, he starts to spin. So if I step in front of him and block his spin, it'll snap him out of it. Oh, okay. I, Mom's here. It's all good. So every dog is a little bit different and takes a little bit of time to figure out the best ways to do it. But if food isn't your best option, then trying things, noises, touch, and toys are going to be generally your easiest ways to go about it. But experiment, try different things out. Every dog is different. Um, what works for my dogs might not work for your dog. What works for the dogs who are here for boarding right now may not work for the dogs who are here tomorrow. It's, a, I wish dogs were more predictable and that everything would work for one dog because it would make my life a lot easier, but it would also make me pretty irrelevant. <laughs> so I kind of appreciate that they're all, all a little bit different, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you for joining. I've seen quite a few of you pop in and out throughout the stream today. I really appreciate it. Like I said, we're going to be doing them throughout the whole month of August at 4 p.m. Next week, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 
And the week after that, I think it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I was able to get some more in there for you. All talking on the same general subject of anxiety in dogs. So if you feel like your dog has overstimulation issues, anxiety issues, make sure that you're stopping by at 4 p.m. Eastern time on almost every day this month. There's only a few days that I'm not doing it. So come on by and ask your questions there. In the meantime, give your dog a pet, rub behind those ears for me and do a scatter feed tonight just to see how it goes and see how much they like it. And let me know how it goes in the comments after you try. Anyway, have a great weekend. Hopefully if you're in the thunderstorms right now, your dogs aren't freaking out too bad, but if they are, put on some lovely music for them or some white noise to help take the edge off just a little bit. And I will see you next Monday at four.